Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to do part 2 of the highly requested Gota foreshadowing series. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video because we are just going through some of the best foreshadowing moments that Oda has shown us throughout the series. Today we are discussing East Blue foreshadowing including Sanji from all the way back in the day in Baratie. Then we also have a small detail that I think may have foreshadowed the existence of King or the Lunarian since chapter 49. And we will be talking about Fishman Island and Jinbei foreshadowing as well. And to end the video off, we have a cameo from Riley in the East Blue saga when he wasn't even shown until Sab Odi. So if you love One Piece, you love go to foreshadowing videos, hit the like button, subscribe, and let's support the series. And without further ado, let's get into the video. So starting out the video, I've recently been rereading the East Blue Saga, and you guys are not going to believe the amount of groundwork and foreshadowing Oda has put into One Piece from the very beginning. On the previous video, we spoke about Logtown, Romance Dawn, and even Seer Village, but today we have to talk about Baratie. In chapter 415, Sanji unleashes Diable Jambi for the first time. This resulted in the defeat of Jabara at Ina's lobby, and it's also my favorite Sanji moment in the entire series. Heck, when it happened, it didn't make much sense for Sanji, and it was always described as his passion burning bright. Now looking forward into 2021 and we had a chapter 1023 where we see a conversation between Sanji and Queen. Queen says how he's heard of Sanji and his siblings who are cyborgs and from his past Mads days he is a bit credible in his field connections to Judge and many other scientists. Queen himself is a cyborg as well and he asked Sanji if his leg is a machine part since he can create fire. With this idea of Sanji being a modified human with his fire abilities, let's take it all the way back to Baratie. 900 chapters before, we have a chapter where Sanji is facing off a one-on-one one against one of the most lame and forgettable characters in the entire One Piece series, and that is Pearl. Pearl is able to create fire, and this is now a dangerous situation on the Baratie. But Sanji, he rushes in with no fear and jumps over and through the fire, kicking Pearl in the process. And you have responses like, why would Sanji do that? Is he not afraid to burn alive? Not even animals could jump that wall of fire. And Oda just plays it off as Sanji being a cool ass dude and says, you can't be a cook if you're afraid of a little fire. We even saw Luffy sense the heat, but Sanji is not phased in the slightest. This could also play into the theory that Sanji has some kind of Lunarian lineage factor from tampering by Judge, but it could also just be a foreshadowing to what Queen suspects, Sanji being a cyborg and having a special leg. No matter what the outcome is, when it comes to Sanji's strange body, it's great to see Oda leaving hints from the beginning that Sanji and Zoro are not normal. In fact, they've never been portrayed as normal, they've always been special, and Nami and Usopp have pointed this out for the entire series, and Sanji and Zoro themselves have always known this. For example, you have Zoro who will just claim that he needs a little sleep and then he's magically able to run and fight as they have been deadly wounds in Orange Town. Same thing with Luffy, he just takes a bite of a chicken leg and he's good to go. But with Sanji, if he is a cyborg, that would be crazy because he's always been extremely durable, he's always had the defensive capabilities, and with this fire leg, I've always wondered how did this happen? We need a better explanation than just a passionate cook. What do you guys think? Has Oda always been foreshadowing that Sanji has a special body, maybe even a cyborg body, or was it just to make him look cool and then Oda simply improvised down the line? And up next, we have more Baratie, and this time we're talking more about King and the Lunarians, because in chapter 49, we have a possible reference to King and his race. So the chefs of Baratie say they never heard of Hawkeye Mihawk, but instead they said they heard of Old Red Eyes. He drank so much and his eyes turned red, then the fool caught on fire and exploded. So obviously we have what seems to be a fun random gag with someone drinking so much that their eyes turn red and they called him Old Red Eyes. But the last part is just unnecessary and random. I'm assuming it comes from an old superstition of human combustion where some people will just joke around if you drink too much you'll catch on fire. But this little gag quite literally describes King from Kaido's crew. In the anime, King has red eyes and he can also explode into fire and that's what Whitebeard says is unique to Lunarians. During his fight with Zoro, we know that King can turn his fire on and off and he can even combust himself at will. But at the end of the day, what do you guys think? Was this old red eyes a Lunarian, maybe King, or was this just a bad joke? In my opinion, it probably wasn't a plan foreshadowing because that would be a 1000 chapter setup just for someone that we have barely any info on. Although I do think it would be cool if some of Oda's editors went back read this chapter, brought it up to Oda, and he canonized it where we see maybe a flashback of King and Baratie. And so moving on, in episode 3 of the One Piece anime, we have foreshadowing to Kaido and Whitebeard's Devil Fruits. So this might be a coincidence because it is only in the anime, but considering how important Whitebeard and Kaido's fruits are, I'm not so sure. And what we have here is Axe and Morgan beginning to explain to his subordinates what Devil Fruits are. There are two examples that he gives. The first one is the ability to breathe fire, and the second one is a Devil Fruit that can create tsunamis. This is just crazy to me because of 
of the two Yonko abilities, we see Kaido who can breathe fire with his mythical dragon, and then we have Whitebeard who can create earthquakes and tsunamis, two of the best and most powerful devil fruits in the whole world, and it's understandable that XM Morgan is speaking of his abilities as pure legends. If Oda told them to throw this in, then that would be amazing, especially with how important they both are. We even have Sengoku saying that this is the man who can destroy the world, and I think that does have to do a lot with Whitebeard's devil fruit. Meanwhile, Kaido, he's just an absolute tank, but one of the best devil fruits I've ever seen, man. He is just going crazy during the Onigashima raid. You also have to consider that Vegapunk did want to clone Kaido's devil fruit, so there is some kind of importance to these devil fruits. Let's not forget that Blackbeard knew that he wanted Whitebeard's devil fruit, and he even found a way to get it too. So maybe Oda did tell the anime to slide this in there and give them two examples that he did have ideas for in the future. If you look at something like the movies where they're going to have non-canon devil fruits, they have to come to Oda and ask him if he's going to use it down the line. So what do you guys think about this anime only moment? Make sure to let me know down in the comments. And now let's talk about Jinbei and Fishman Island foreshadowing since Baratie and Arlong Park. What if I told you that Fishman Island, an arc that came around 600 chapters into One Piece, was brought up in the East Blue Saga? Well this one is just shocking to me, but it was placed perfectly. That is because Jinbei is brought up as the Straw Hats are heading towards Fishman Island, so it just fits right there. Was it Oda just simply name dropping someone? He didn't have any idea of what to do with Jinbei's character, not even his design, and he just said, okay, well I'll give him a name. And the crazy thing is, I completely overlooked this. I did not know about Jinbei until Impel Down. I don't even remember anything about Jinbei. It was only rereading this that I remembered, oh yeah, they did bring up Jinbei back in Fishman Island. He was set up as a warlord from this time when he's mentioned, and even having connections to the Fishman Pirates. We find out how the Fishman Pirates made a return, but then they split up. We know that from his backstory as well, so Oda did keep that consistency, so you gotta thank him for that. One problem with this though is that they say that Jinbei used to be on a similar level to Arlong back in the day, so did Jinbei really just get this much stronger than Arlong? Did he really level up that much harder? I mean, that's absolutely absurd to me if Arlong was really that close to power or that respected alongside Jinbei, who was a warlord. He's been messing with Yonko. <laughs> So that was a little bit confusing when you go and reread that section. I liked Orlon because he hyped up his brothers and his race so much as a whole. It makes sense what he's saying that they'll have an advantage in the sea. But then later on, we see Luffy fire punch a fish man while underwater in Fishman Island. The biggest threat in Fishman Island was Hody Jones. So maybe Oda didn't execute on the hype of Arlong hyping up the fish man, but it was cool to see Jinbei being name dropped all the way back in Arlong Park. And then we have a panda shark who washes up on Baratie with one of the big bro Zoro guys stuck inside, which by the way, that is one of the greatest entrances in all of anime. And this leads to the first first mention of Fishman Island itself because I remember that it was mentioned in Water 7 as they were building it from there and they talked about the mermaid that was in Fishman Island. You had a lot of references with Tom and this is actually the very first mention of Fishman Island. It was supposed to be their next destination after Sapodi and this plan got all off track going into the Summit War Saga. There's another point that I hear people bringing up about Fishman Island is that it was always hyped up, always foreshadowed. So when you have something being built up for so long, it was just a little bit disappointing to see the execution. Okoro and Tom who were from Fishman Island and Tom was a cow fishman and Kokoro was a mermaid. And then with Shirahoshi, Whitebeard being connected to Fishman Island, Roger going back and forth, yeah, Poseidon, the Sea Kings, the Noah. Of course, now we know that Fishman Island is actually very important to the world of One Piece. And there was also this cool little reference right here where all along Park, we find out that Hachi is the second strongest swordsman from the Fishman. And then later on during the Fishman Island arc, we discover another octopus like Fishman, Hyozo, who was the strongest Fishman swordsman. So we had a little bit of foreshadowing, a little bit of a hint there that Zoro would be going against the final strongest swordsman out of all the fishmen during the fishman island arc overall foreshadowing the jimbei and fishman island it makes a lot of sense since all along park was a fishman you have the entire main antagonist crew being fishmen and even though all along was a blade and fishman supremacist and killed humans you could say this also foreshadowed a mistreatment of the fishman race or at least some intrinsic racism that would later be explored down the line of saba Odi and fishman island and now moving on to the final foreshadowing let's talk about dark king silver israeli all the way back into the East Blue, we have a little mini flashback of Buggy back in his days with Shanks. We have a panel where we see Riley, and there's also Gabin that shows up. Shanks is fighting with Buggy, and Riley's just stepping in like he always does. We even see this exact same parallel to Riley stepping in when Buggy and Shanks were fighting during the Odin flashback. But when you sit down and think about that Riley was introduced here, we had a little glimpse of that. So once we saw Riley and Sapa Odi, you could actually put the pieces together because we didn't know when we saw this Buggy flashback that Roger was the captain of the crew. So when we find out in Seba Odi that Riley was a right hand man to Roger and his crew. Then you could put all the pieces together and realize that Shanks and Buggy was on Roger's crew. You also have Whitebeard asking about Buggy. So there was a lot of foreshadowing here and a lot of build up to find out about Shanks. 
again man this just blew my mind looking back rereading the orange town arc and you see bogey the clown you see riley man that is just so crazy to me i just always had a feeling that he was planning out shakes and roger to be in the same crew and it's just all been there since the start but anyways guys out of all of these examples what was your favorite go to foreshadowing moment was it fishman island was it jimbe was it riley being in the east blue saga were they actually talking about lunarians in the baratia arc or was that just some kind of coincidence you never know it could be but anyways guys if you want to see part three to the go to foreshadowing series don't forget to like button don't forget to subscribe and have a great day.